Good afternoon. My name is Mike Carney, and I am delighted to welcome you to Return to Work Travel Edition from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. I'm actually living the message today. I'm traveling for work, uh, and we have been very excited to host today's event because we, we realize how important the travel industry is and how hard it's been impacted by the pandemic. So today, we're going to talk about the road ahead. We're going to talk about why returning to business and leisure travel is essential to economic recovery. Over the next hour, you're going to hear from leaders and experts across the industry, both in the U.S. and abroad, on where things stand now, what to expect in the coming months, and how manufacturers and airlines have adapted to restore confidence in travel and increase safety for customers. We'll also learn more about the science, the science behind air travel and the safety the, the steps that uh, companies are taking to keep you safe while you travel. And we'll hear from a small business owner, someone who's been impacted by the pandemic and is planning for the future. We don't want anyone to think that the pandemic is over. It's not. The most important thing that you can do right now is make sure that you and those you work with and those in your family are vaccinated against COVID-19. But as more and more Americans become vaccinated, more and more Americans can resume business travel. And there's ways to do it safely, and there's ways to do it uh, that will get us back to a more uh, dynamic economy. So we have a lot to cover. Uh, let's get to it, and I'll be back later on. Thanks again for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Vic Krishnan, I'm a partner at McKinsey & Company. I lead our travel practice in North America. I've got my colleague Jillian with us um, who will uh, launch us off and then I'll pick this up uh, further along. Jillian, over to you. Great, hi everyone. My name is Jillian Telez. I'm a partner out of McKinsey's Atlanta office. Like Vic, I focus my work in the travel space, serving everything from airlines, hotels, cruise lines. Um, so excited to be here with all of you today and share some of our perspectives on what the return of US travel might look like. All right, so if we can pull up our page. Excellent, so if you go to the next page, we just want to quickly, uh, you can go one more actually. Um, we just wanted to quickly acknowledge, you know, we'll talk about the return of US travel post COVID, but wanted to first acknowledge that COVID is of course a global humanitarian challenge. And while the return of travel is an important piece and top of mind for any that's attending today, it's, it's just a piece of the overall picture. If you go to the next page, as we all know, the travel industry has been severely impacted by COVID-19, essentially coming to a complete standstill in early 2020. The good news is the industry has progressively rebounded. And as of late June or early July, we're seeing TSA throughput, throughput at around 80% of 2019 levels and RevPAR just a bit above that. So of course, this varies quite a bit by market and by type of traveler, leisure, leisure versus business. But I know I personally have been on several flights in the last couple of weeks. And I think anyone who has been in an airport or on a flight can attest that it is no longer the ghost town that we saw towards the end and towards the middle of last year. So if you go to the next page, why, why is that? Why are we seeing this rebound? Um, I, I think one piece of it is you're seeing a lot of, a lot of pent up demand that's being unleashed at around the same time. So travel was one of the most missed activities during COVID. And in fact, many consumers are looking for a way to treat themselves or to splurge after what has been an extremely difficult year or year and a half for all of us. Um, so what you see on this page is from our surveys, just over half of US consumers plan to treat themselves or splurge on, on something. And that number looks even higher for wealthier households who have had job security and have accumulated savings over the course of COVID, as well as millennials and younger generations. So if you move to the next page, unsurprisingly, travel is near the top of the list for what folks want to splurge on. Um, it's coming in just behind restaurants and dining. And of course, uh, the timing for the travel you know, it's more so than other categories depends on government restrictions and COVID spread. And in fact, the destination of that travel will depend on that as well. But by and large, what we're seeing is a healthy recovery in leisure travel, given the pent up demand and the high desire to engage in travel after over a year of being grounded. If you move to the next page, 
corporate travel is, of course, a, a different story. Um, you know, like leisure travel, corporate travel saw an unprecedented drop. Oxford Economics and GBTA show around a 50 to 55 percent drop in 2020 relative to 2019 levels. And of course, that includes a relatively normal Q1. Um, and while no one has a crystal ball on when corporate travel will come back, there are a few things that we do know. Uh, one is the predictions vary quite significantly. Some saying permanent 50 percent reduction on the more pessimistic side. Um, all the way up to a full recovery as early as, you know, early 2023 on the optimistic side. Um, but for the most part, the general view is we'll get, you know, to 2019 levels sometime around 2024. And then the second thing that we know is there will be a very different recovery timeline for domestic versus international. Um, in China, we saw a fast recovery of domestic business travel in late 2020. And in the U.S., on the right hand side of the page, you can see 63 percent of companies surveyed so they plan to resume business travel in the next one to three months. And I know, you know, we are amongst those that are beginning to return to business travel. Uh, but of course, international travel will be much slower to respond given the reduced airlift and government restrictions, which are constantly changing. If you move to the next page, the third thing that we know about corporate travel recovery is there is a difference by travel reason or use case. So on one hand, um, travel for core operations, so think of manufacturing plant visits, that never stopped in many cases, even during the peak of COVID. And sales meetings are recovering relatively quickly, particularly you know, as you think about new large customers for companies. Uh, but then on the other hand, just as we see international long distance travel being the slowest to return, we see large multinational in-person conferences as being amongst kind of those slower use cases to return, at least in a fully in-person setting, we have seen some success with hybrid formats. So all in all, you'll likely see a bit of a lumpy recovery in, in business travel. And I'll hand it over to Vic to talk a little bit about what this might look like from an industry perspective. Thanks, Jillian. Uh, if we move to the next page, uh, we looked at China because we thought China's corporate travel recovery process could be instructive. They're ahead of the rest of the world in terms of the progression of the pandemic, but also the return to pre-crisis levels of corporate travel. So if you look at the resource development and real estate sectors in China, they appear to have recovered a lot faster than government or defense or utilities. So while not all of these insights are generalizable to the US, there's only some parallels between China's business travel recovery journey and that of the US, it certainly has helped shape our thinking as we look to understand which sectors might recover faster than others. On the next page, when we think about recovery, we see four primary segments. First, the never left segment, which comprises about 15% of spend. Jillian referenced the manufacturing environment earlier. Many of these companies that are in this space um, are the types of companies and or use cases or travel or, or occasions that never really went away. So upstream oil and gas, you know, we didn't have large scale closure of, uh, of gas pipelines or of oil fields. And therefore, a lot of their, those types of employees were traveling throughout the pandemic. At the other end of the spectrum is a, the sectors like tech that might be more reluctant to return full tilt. They represent about a, a, a fifth of, of corporate travel spend. Um, and uh, they, these sectors may never really actually truly recover because they found alternative ways of conducting business um, or have been able to use teleconferencing technology very effectively. The largest, largest category by far, though, is the, is the one we call the FOMO, or the fear of missing out segment. That represents about 60% of spend. And in this sector or in this segment, um, competitive pressures drive companies to match essentially what their peers are doing, right? So um, the, the fastest way uh, to get some companies on the road is if they find out that, potential, that competitors are vis visiting their prospective clients. Um, that'll probably get folks on a plane pretty quickly. Um, and this segment, when it does recover, will also likely therefore recover at a faster pace than others. And so many travel suppliers need to be prepared for that. The smallest segment, what we call wait and watch, includes the government and other sectors that are just likely to be slower to return, a lot more cautious, and therefore are probably going to represent the tail end of the recovery journey for corporate travel. On the next page, against the backdrop of recovery, the other consideration 
is the fact that this travel sector has taken on an enormous financial hit during this crisis. The debt burden of airlines around the world is likely to increase by over a trillion dollars in our estimate, right? So when you look at the net debt um, economics of the various travel suppliers before this crisis, you could see a world where uh, credit ratings for airlines worsen by about five plus notches in the typical credit rating agency rankings. And as a result, airline debt uh, and travel sector debt broadly just becomes less attractive to own um, if you're a debt holder. We estimate that given the large debt burden of over a trillion dollars, some airlines, especially those outside the US, may be paying all of this debt down all the way to 2030. There is cause for optimism that the US will do this faster. Um, in fact, some of the earnings announcements from the US airlines in the last week or so have suggested that some airlines expect to fully pay down all of the additional debt taken by, during COVID um, as soon as 2025 or 26, but we're still talking several years away rather than something that happens relatively quickly. On the next page, as demand recovers, our travel sector clients are focused on a number of topics, and we've picked four major themes that seem to be top of mind for airline, hotel, um, car rental, and other travel sector CEOs and leaders. The first is the need to use real-time data to assess where the puck is moving um, to, and so therefore to take competitive actions to address future demand and future consumer preferences in a way that, that they did not necessarily need to pre-pandemic. Second, many of our travel sector clients are having to compress their planning cycles to make sure that capacity can be reallocated, hotels can be reopened, et cetera, at a much faster pace uh, than they did prior to this crisis. I mean, we've all heard stories um, and if any of you have traveled to you know, leisure or nature-focused destinations like Florida or Hawaii, um, you'd notice that, for example, we don't have a lot of rental cars in this country right now, and that's not been an area, uh, or it has been hard to essentially replenish the stock of rental cars because of semiconductor short shortage that has affected many parts of the economy. So long way of saying, um, agility in, in planning is going to be quite critical. Third, we also see companies trying to make sure that comfort and safety are paramount as they bring people back. Reassuring employees, as Mark mentioned earlier, that corporate travel is safe and that can be, it can be done without jeopardy to personal health um, is going to be quite important. And therefore, we see a lot of travel sector suppliers focused on this topic uh, quite intently. Fourth, we also see much sharper, more frequent communication necessary between company leaders and their employees. Leaders need to be in the field with their colleagues and role model behavior in terms of what they expect their employees to be doing during this pandemic. So when you put this all together, we look forward to the safe recovery of corporate travel and to the return of financial stability to a sector that has perhaps been worse affected by this pandemic than any other. Thank you all for your time. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rita Patel. I'm owner of Hotel Trundle in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, thank you, Vic and Jillian. Uh, that was incredible. Um, what I'm about to share is very indicative of what you're um, forecasting and what you've shared with us today. Um, so my husband and I, we um, opened Hotel Trundle in 2018. Um, and uh, we're a 41 boutique, 41 room boutique hotel nestled right in the Main Street District of Columbia, South Carolina. Um, we met in grad school while studying architecture. Um, we got married during the recession in 2010 and there was no work for our industry. Um, we worked seven jobs, hustled for several years, um, and then decided to do a career change when the economy started to get back on its feet um, and joined my parents' 40-year-old business of owning and operating branded hotels. Um, during that time, we stumbled across the opportunity to develop Hotel Trundle, which you'll see some of the slides rolling here. Um, and we decided to take a leap of faith with our two boys in mind um, and develop the property on our own outside of my parents' business. Um, so fast forward to April and to today, um, we're really proud to 
claimed multiple awards and recognitions, um, including a very coveted spot in Southern Living Hotel collection, um, recognitions in um, national publications like Garden and Gun and uh, Food and Wine. Um, we're very proud of our Community Choice Award uh, four years in a row, Best Hotel. So um, that's a little bit about us and um, where Hotel Trundle came from. Um, the guests that stay with us are those people looking for something different regarding um, level of service, amenities, um, and the design of our spaces um, while traveling. We've been described as having the allure of Mad Men with the quirk of Lisa Frank. So to throw it back to the 80s. Um, but um, hopefully this will give you a little snapshot of what we're about and what we like to share with our guests. Um, so pre-COVID, our Monday through Thursday were those corporate travelers um, staying with us for um, various meetings. The state house isn't very far from us either. So uh, we filled our rooms with corporate travelers. Um, <clears throat> Thursday night through Sunday were definitely our leisure guests, weddings, parties, celebrations, um, and all of that good stuff. So in our lobbies, we're, our lobby were full of people enjoying happy hour, mingling, gathering. Um, we have a really great space for uh, remote working, um, but that all came to a halt uh, March 13th of 2020. And that's the day the phones would not stop ringing for cancellations. It was, it was devastating. We, I remember um, looking over at my husband, Marcus, and I'm like, what is happening? What is going on? What are we going to do? It was just, we weren't ready. We weren't prepared. We didn't know what was happening. Um, and over the course of a few days after the 13th, we had lost $140,000 in room revenue. So you can imagine what the rest of the year, I, I wrote some stats down. Um, it, so to put it in better perspective, at the end of 2020, our gross revenue had been cut in half compared to 2019. Um, even with dropping our rates by over 14%, our occupancy had dropped by 23%, um, which I'm sure a lot of you in the audience, which I can't see or wish I could, but can really relate to what those losses translate to and the future of the growth of your business. Um, but, you know, I think what we did was really harness the silver linings about being an independent property. We're able to pivot and make changes very fast and very quickly to accommodate our guests' needs, our team's needs, making sure everyone was healthy and safe. Um, sending the right messages to our community, sharing, using social media primarily during that, that time. We, we did close for six weeks, which is unheard of for a hotel. You know, we're 365, seven days a week, um, 24 hours. But we took that time to make sure our teens and their families were safe and healthy. Um, we implemented lots of strategies to attract the drive market once we reopened. Um, highlighting those treasures of our city that people don't really know about, like our markets, our our natural resources. Um, we partnered with other small businesses, which I cannot, we really pride our, ourselves on um, partnering and have been since we opened, using them as vendors and suppliers. So it was invaluable at that time when everyone picked up our phone calls on the first ring and understood exactly what we were going through and there was no um, hesitation in pausing services or, or orders. So um, that was extreme. I'm getting emotional because it's just so special. But um, moving forward, I think we're really excited now as we're transitioning out of the pandemic, um, inviting all of those, you know, um, long lost friends that we haven't seen in so long, our guests that used to come and see us all the time, they're, they're coming back. Our weddings are coming back. My favorite thing on Friday afternoons is seeing the reunions between families and how, how they haven't seen each other in so long. It's just truly a special place to be, to be that, that part of someone's return to travel. And um, we are looking forward to um, having our corporate travelers back. We hear murmurs of fall uh, for our city. Um, 
but we continue to market and focus on our drive market, which are those neighboring cities near us and um, take advantage of what our city has to offer and showcase that to attract people to our hotel. Um, and I think that's about it. I, I welcome all of you to come and visit if you're in town and a shameless plug of being nominated as one of the top 10 historic hotels for USA Today. The link is in our Instagram bio if you would like to for us. So we would appreciate that. But thank you again for inviting me to be part of this conversation. It's really cool to hear um, what was just presented and I'm excited to hear what everybody else has to say. My name is Sarah Schaefer, and I'm the Vice President of Communications at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Today, I'm joined by Dan Freeman, Vice President of Safety Management at the Boeing Company. Thanks so much for being here, Dan. Thanks very much for having me here. So I'm a big believer in the transformative power of travel, and I'm so excited to talk to you today. So let's get going. You bet. What are aviation experts and industry leaders doing to reassure passengers about safety of air travel amid the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, we're uh, cooperating with uh, worldwide agencies, with academic organizations, with medical organizations, uh, other air framers, uh, and a variety of uh, constituents to really work together to solve the issues around safe air travel. Uh, if you think about um, uh, the airplane, and which is obviously our, our wheelhouse, um, we're uh, really uh, gen uh, generating the science and the data associated with uh, virus transmission in the air travel system. And the data we have is that the risk of uh, virus transmission is very low. We look at uh, the, the ways of transmitting the virus uh, as far as touch or phone-like transmission, as well as through aerosols. And we've been working with our operators to ensure that there are um, the right provisions in place to minimize uh, the exposure during the air travel journey. Very interesting. and. Uh, perhaps more than any other, the travel industry has absolutely been decimated because of this global crisis. Tell me about what Boeing is doing to support the short and long-term recovery of this important industry. Yeah, it, it's, it's really, uh, to give confidence in air travel, there's really two primary things. Uh, the traveler needs to feel safe and be safe as part of the journey. And then uh, the travel has to be um, uh, predictable. People have to be able to get to their destination and, and get home and understand the travel journey. And we've really um, approached this from both of those perspectives. So first around being safe, uh, we, we make sure that um, the airplane itself is safe. We have a variety of disinfectants and disinfecting technologies that we've been implementing in the industry. Uh, we also have been uh, analyzing deeply the airflow in the airplane and ensuring that uh, the aerosol risk is very low. Um, and, uh, that, and, and we've been communicating that in a variety of forums so that people really understand um, that it's one of the safest places that you could be as part of your journey. But uh, in addition to that, um, it's important to have travel be predictable. So they have to understand what credentials or protocols they need to have. They need to be able to uh, know that when they get to their destination, they, they uh, will have the experience they expect. And so uh, making sure that they understand what testing or quarantine requirements uh, are really necessary. And they have to have confidence they can get home again. Uh, from, from their journey. So uh, it's, it's really important to communicate and work as a community to have standards and to have clear expectations so that it's safe and predictable, which will bring back confidence in your travel. And speaking of the travel journey, I've been reading a lot about the dreaming and planning phase of the journey lately, and especially um, about this trend called revenge travel, where people are planning bucket list trips to make up for time spent at home last year. So with that in mind, uh, tell me about the next phase of ensuring a safe return to international travel. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, going back to that predictable travel journey, um, uh, I know that uh, uh, international travel is on my bucket list as well. Um, I'm, I'm right in that uh, dreaming phase right now. and um, but, but it's really hard to figure out, um, should I be planning for a fall um, destination to a particular country if I really don't understand what the protocol is going to be? And so um, I think, and, and I know with the pandemic, um, predictability is really tough. Uh, it's, it, you can't really predict what the state of the world is going to be. Uh, so having a data-driven approach by people who say, Here, here's 
what the conditions will be uh, at the um, at the conditions uh, within the uh, within aviation or within the, the country. I think are going to be an essential part to give people the opportunity to uh, plan and predict when they'll be able to do this travel. Because uh, I, I do believe that there is a pent up demand for travel. Absolutely, I've been reading so much about that pent up demand, and um, I'm so glad to see signs of recovery on the horizon for you know this industry. It's such an important economic driver. Um, speaking of you know importance and, and economics, this pandemic has shown that. Uh, you know, a global crisis requires global collaboration to make a difference. Um, tell me about, you know, how important it is for governments, medical experts, industry leaders, and other stakeholders to come together at a time like this to safely reopen the world. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, when we started uh, working on this back in early uh, 2020, uh, we approached it as um, a, a typical aerospace manufacturer using aerospace practices and principles. And we quickly realized that this is not a, a typical aerospace threat. So um, where we brought technical experts uh, in to really help us with you know, testing and the science, uh, we had to quickly move to um, in, engaging with a, a wide variety of people across the industry. We formed really strong partnerships with universities, with government agencies, with uh, uh, industry organizations like IATA and ICAO. Uh, we've also uh, worked with our competitors. I chair um, a committee of um, airframe manufacturers where we um, uh, work collaboratively on in areas that are not competitive, including our response to the pandemic. Uh, it, it's been an unprecedented amount of collaboration. And it, working together isn't sufficient uh, because the results of our work needs to be transparent as well. And so Boeing is actually uh, taken a, a step that we've never taken before, and we've actually published um, broadly our, our test data, our analysis, and results on our Boeing website, where anybody can come and see the detailed work that we tra traditionally have not shared. And um, so the other airframe manufacturers, uh, universities, and uh, technology developers can have access to a wide variety of detailed data that will help the world really uh, build upon uh, the work that each other does. Uh, and not have to reinvent it in every sort of compartment around the world. So this, is, this has been unprecedented, but it's been a really important development in our general response to the pandemic, which is affecting us all. These surely are unprecedented times. Thank you so much, Dan, for your insights and being here with us today. Thank you very much for having me. Hi everyone, pleasure to join you today to talk about um, risk or placing risk in context during air travel. So my name is Joe Allen. I'm a professor at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where I run the Healthy Buildings program there. My background is in exposure and risk science, worker health and safety, uh, and I've been advising organizations really across the spectrum since the uh, COVID first hit, starting actually January 2020, uh, advising major companies in finance, biotech, uh, entertainment, uh, universities, K-12 schools, really across uh, all sectors of the U.S. economy and thinking about how to mitigate or minimize risk uh, and control this hazard that is novel to all of us, certainly because it's a pandemic, but in some ways it's uh, there's aspects of it that are actually quite familiar. And so for years before uh, joining the faculty at Harvard, I conducted forensic investigations of sick buildings. And through that experience, um, we were able to you know, identify, assess, and ultimately control all sorts of hazards in the workplace, radiological, chemical, and even biological hazards like this one. So the difference here is, of course, the scale and magnitude and scope, and everyone is impacted. But the fundamentals are still the same. I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, and one other bit of credentialing, just so uh, we place a frame of reference here for travel, is I'm a, a commissioner on the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. And I chair the Lancet COVID-19 Commission Task Force on Safe Schools, Safe Work, and Safe Travel. Also, in 2013, uh, I was part of a team that conducted and led a National Academies report on infectious disease transmission in airplanes and airports. And that's really one I, I want to start off on that jumping point. So even back in 2013, we knew a lot. Harvard 
was an FAA Center of Excellence looking at air quality in the airplane cabin. So there were FAA Center of Excellence that did this. We were part of a research consortium. And in that, at that time period, 2013, we identified a few of the key trends that we needed to track, this industry in particular, thinking about mental health, the issue of bleed air contamination, chemicals in the, uh, in the cabin, uh, noise and acoustics, fuel efficiency, of course, of course, and ventilation. And the number one thing we flagged was infectious disease transmission. So we've been thinking about this for a long time, been researching it for a long time and talking about it. And this report we wrote was published in 2013. So if you're interested in tracking it down, it's the ACRP report number 91, Airport Cooperative Research Program report number 91, Infectious Disease Mitigation in Airports and on Airplanes. And we broke out our recommendations into three categories, mitigation that should take in the airport buildings, in, uh, interventions that should take place on the airplane, and last, what people should be doing. And so for the short time I have here with you all, I'm going to talk about the airplane uh, in particular. Before we start thinking about control strategies and why the airplane works so well, we have to understand how this virus is spread. So you heard in the uh, prior presentation talking about different modes of transmission. So we primarily have three modes of transmission we're worried about. One is this: uh, these large droplets that you get from close contract that actually land on you in one of your nasal mucosa when somebody spits or coughs. Two, surface transmission, what we call fomite transmission. And three is airborne transmission. That's these finer aerosols that we emit constantly when we're just talking, breathing, singing, saying ah, we're constantly emitting respiratory aerosols. Turns out that uh, we actually knew this early on, but I think CDC, World Health Organization, and others are finally catching up to where the science was that the dominant mode of transmission is airborne transmission, respiratory aerosols that are released. When we're breathing, we're emitting these aerosols. If we're infectious, they will carry the virus. These virus particles will travel beyond six feet. They'll travel well across any room and they will concentrate in any room that's under ventilated. That's the key part. One way to think about uh, these respiratory aerosols is like cigarette smoke. So if I'm smoking a cigarette and you're right near me, you are going to get a large dose of that cigarette smoke, much like my respiratory aerosols. If you're across the room, you'll smell it, but the dose will be less. If it's a room that's really sealed up, well, over time, you're gonna be breathing a lot of that cigarette smoke. If you open a window of a high ventilation rate, you may not even know that I'm smoking. And outdoors, you might walk by me within a couple of feet and not even know I'm smoking a cigarette because of unlimited ventilation and dilution. So we really have to think about these buildup of aerosols, respiratory aerosols, and how they're removed I'm going to talk about what happens on an airplane in a second. And we need to be much less focused on surface transmission. Uh, I wrote an article in November in the Washington Post, probably with something that, uh, with, with an opening line that would shock most people, that we didn't have a single well documented case of surface transmission from SARS CoV 2, the virus that causes COVID 19. Not a single well documented case. Yet, look around what's happening businesses, organizations, air, airplane, airliners, uh, airports are spending a small fortune focusing on surfaces without focusing on the real threat, which is airborne transmission. So let's talk about why uh, airplanes, I, my feeling is that they're a low risk environment. So last year, last May, I published an article in the Washington Post uh, with the title, Airplanes make you, Don't Make You Sick, Really. And so I think a lot of people might've uh, been surprised at that headline uh, and maybe thought it was even dangerous or even preposterous to propose that, especially during a pandemic. But the reality is, is that the ventilation system on an airplane works quickly to dilute respiratory aerosols. So if you think about what's happening in an airplane, you have a 50-50 mix of fresh air and recirculated air. So the air is, for most airplanes, bled off the engine, called bleed air, comes in off the engine, it's, it's, cool, it's, um, it's treated, and then it's delivered to your seat. 50% of that gets recirculated, but it gets recirculated through HEPA filters, high efficiency particulate air filters that capture 99.97% of airborne particles. So the best filters you can find, certainly better than anything you'd find in any building uh, with the exception of a hospital. Now, the amount of fresh outdoor air coming in matters too. In an airplane, you get anywhere from 10, 15, 20, or 25 air changes per hour. And to put that in perspective, in a home, you get half an air change per hour. Half the air is replaced with outdoor air. Airplane, you're getting 10, 20 times, 30 or 40 times more than that. In a typical hospital room, you get a total of six air changes per hour. In uh, airborne infection isolation rooms right now, you get up to maybe 12 air changes per hour. So I mentioned that as a point of reference, schools, three air changes per hour. Airplane, you get a lot of turnover of air, plus the air that's recirculated goes through a 
a filter that captures over 99% of the particles. T typical filters in a building capture less than 20% of those particles. Um, and so for those reasons, you have actually um, a, a, a quick or rapid dilution of any respiratory aerosols. Even more important, think about how the air comes into an office room, a room in an office building. Usually it comes in in one corner, leaves in the other. You can have short circuiting, right? Not every room, part of the room gets the same amount of air. In an airplane, the air is delivered right at each row, right? Or essentially at each seat if you open up your gasper on your on the uh, overhead ventilation. And this return is at the floor. So you have really high ventilation effectiveness, meaning the air is delivered right to the people and it's uh, removed out. It's not like the air comes into the front of the airplane and leaves out the back after, breath after running across the breathing zone of everybody in the space. So for those reasons why I feel confident mentioning in that, uh, in that opinion uh, over a year ago and mentioning it ever since that airplanes are low risk um, transmission. If you look at the epidemiology, so that's looking at it from the environmental control system. If you look at the epidemiology, we pointed this out in our 2013 report and the same exists today, that you have billions and billions of travelers. If the airplane was this hotbed of transmission, we would have seen this well before COVID-19 and we've seen it uh, with COVID-19. In other words, Transmission can happen anywhere. There's no place that's zero risk. And occasionally it does happen on an airplane, but it's because the denominator is so large, the millions and tens of millions of billions of travelers, um, it's actually a very small uh, likelihood of it happening on an airplane. When we look at other, going back 40 or 50 years, you look for the at the scientific literature looking for uh, outbreaks attributed to airplanes, you don't find many. You only find a handful against, again, the backdrop of billions of flights and travelers. Last thing I'll say though, um, is that airplanes are vectors of disease, right? Transmission. So this is how uh, this virus and others travel so swiftly around uh, the world between countries and also within countries. So we have to be careful about how we think about air travel in that regard. But in terms of someone's individual risk on an airplane is quite low, added mass on top of that, and it further reduces uh, this to being a very low risk. I do wanna point out with my last two minutes here, um, an issue that we raised in 2013 that I don't know it has been addressed. And if it has been addressed, I'd love to hear back from people that it has. But we started doing monitoring of carbon dioxide as a, a tracer for ventilation in airplanes. We published a paper on this many years ago. And we find that the concentrations of CO2, carbon dioxide during boarding, um, can be uh, elevated. And we, we attribute this to when planes are at the gate they don't always have their ventilation system running. So the airplane gets terrific ventilation and filtration when the system is running. But if they don't have the system running when you're at the gate and boarding, well, now you have a lot of people in a small volume place that can be higher risk. To put some numbers on this in our paper, we estimate that um, during cruise, most of the time airplanes are meeting um, these, these recommended limits. There are two limits, one by a group ASHRAE, another by the Federal Aviation Regulations, we call the FARS. So during cruise, we found that most of the flights, 96% were meeting the ventilation targets, that's great. During boarding, only 80% were meeting that. And in fact, if you look at the Federal Aviation Regulation, the planes in our study, only 42%, so less than half the airplanes, were meeting the required ventilation targets as people were boarding the airplane. So we've seen this in the data, we've called it out. It was one of the main recommendations we made in our National Academies report in 2013. I put it in my op-ed in the Washington Post last May, calling this out. Ventilation and filtration are terrific on airplanes, but during boarding, if the plane has, doesn't have its systems running or is not connected to the gate ventilation system, uh, this can be a time of higher risk. So thanks for inviting me. I'll wrap up my remarks uh, until uh, 2.40. I'll pass it off to the next speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Rebecca Spicer with Airlines for America. And first I wanna thank the chamber for bringing together this great group of people from a wide range of voices and perspectives. And we are clearly united in our effort to try to restore confidence in the traveler and bring back business travel. Um, especially appreciate the comments just now of Dr. Allen because science has been so key and instrumental throughout the pandemic and airlines have been leaning into science as you heard Dan mention a few years a few minutes ago airlines have been leaning into science along with industry partners since spring of 2020 
Um, the science is there to restore business travel. And we have been turning to the data. We've been looking at the research. And, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, there was no playbook. And that's why we all had to take a pause and say, we need to learn more about the virus, how it is transmitted, which Dr. Allen just talked some about. But also, what can we as airlines, what can we as an industry do to make sure that we're prioritizing the health and the safety and the well-being of the travel? traveling public and the men and women who are employees in this industry. It's no secret that as soon as this pandemic started hitting the United States and the world as well, that it had a devastating impact on, on carriers. We saw a passenger volume decline of up to 96% in the spring of 2020. And at that time, our carriers had to take planes out of service. They had to park them anywhere they could find space, in the middle of the desert or anywhere, and they were parked uh, wing to wing or nose to tail. And you may have seen some of those pictures, but it told quite a powerful story of just how dire the situation was. And as, this, as the bottom was falling out of the industry, our carriers took action promptly and swiftly, again, to ensure that they were doing as much as they could to make sure that people were flying uh, in a smart and healthy manner. For example, they leaned into um, science as we saw that we needed face coverings at, at the beginning to start protecting each other and to reduce that risk of transmission that Dr. Allen referenced. Uh, they started implementing voluntarily pre-flight check forms, simple questions that you have to still to this day complete as you're boarding or checking in. Questions like, do you have a temperature or have you been exposed to COVID? So that we can make sure that people are flying when they are healthy. Airlines leaned into enhanced disinfection and cleaning procedures. They leaned into touchless technology so that we can help reduce touch points um, and make a seamless travel experience. And one of the most critical elements, which Dr. Allen just touched on, was the ventilation and the air filtration on board aircraft. All of these layers, too, came about before the onset of the vaccine distribution. In addition to these layers of protection, airlines reached out to our industry partners, the manufacturers, the airports, and so many others, as we leaned into the existing bodies of research that were out there. We collectively decided that we wanted to approach the Harvard School of Public Health to ask for an independent study, a holistic examination of the air travel experience. These researchers looked at two particular parts of the air travel experience. First, they examined the gate to gate. So once you board that aircraft, you're in flight experience until you deplane. The second study was a larger examination of the entire airport and in-flight experience combined. Looking at once you arrive at the airport, you check in, you go through security checkpoints, you go through the terminal, you may wait at the gate area for a little bit and you board. And then after you deplane, you get off, you go back through another terminal, go to baggage claim, and ultimately to your transportation. As they looked at this entire system and all of the different layers of mitigation that had been put into place at the time, they, they've determined that because of all of these layers, that being on an airplane is as safe, if not safer than, many of our daily activities, like going to eat dinner at a restaurant or going to the grocery store to buy some food. But they leaned in particularly to that air filtration and ventilation system. Dr. Allen did reference it, but I invite you the next time you get on an airplane to take close note of this. Look above you, turn on that vent, feel that air come down on you, go to the floor. You'll notice that as it goes to the floor, it's not crossing from passenger to passenger. It's swept out of the floor and it goes through the HEPA filters, removing the virus and bacteria so that when it does come back in, and as Dr. Allen referenced on a very regular basis, that it's clean of any, of any impurities. And that's why the air on aircraft is as clean as an operating room inside of a hospital. So I invite you to not only think about that the next time you fly, but also I invite you to go to airlines.org to learn more about the extensive research that Harvard did. The recovery right now, well, I would call it encouraging. We're seeing about 2 million people a day clear through security, pack their bags, board those planes and go somewhere. 
And you've probably seen the pictures, lots of people going through airports, people are excited. The reality is it is great and we welcome those people back. It, we are still about 20% down from pre-pandemic levels. Where that decline is, clearly with international travel, with a few exceptions of short haul flights, and also with business travel. Uh, we have seen a small resurgence in some business travel, and we attribute that to the extensive research that is out there and forums like this where we can talk about the data, talk about the science, and start communicating and sharing it. It's up to us to educate and to spread the word. We also know, as the McKinsey report showed, there is enormous pent up demand. If we have learned anything through this pandemic, it is that on a personal level, you can't hug your grandchild or a niece or nephew for the first time over Zoom. And you can't go to a friend's wedding and make a toast over Zoom. On a professional front, you just can't cultivate meaningful relationships by sitting on a computer screen at your kitchen counter. And you sure can't shake hand. You sure can't shake hands um, when you seal the deal after a big day by sitting at your computer. So we agree that we've seen a lot of pinup demand and that people are ready to go. I know firsthand. A few weeks ago, I actually had the privilege of giving my first in person presentation since before the pandemic. It felt really good. It actually felt a little bit like a high school reunion. It was a luncheon in Washington, DC, and it was a bunch of DC communicators um, who also were out for the first time. We reconnected, um, we, we shared stories. I made a few new relationships that day, but I gave a presentation with my counterpart, for, uh, Rosanna Mayetta from the American Hotel and Lodging Association. And we talked exactly about this, about the research and data, the science that shows not only is it safe to be on an airplane, but it, it, that it's safe to go to a meeting at a hotel. And she talked in particular about some of the measures, the protocol changes and the protections that the hotel industry has also put into place. So coupled, we made sure that we were reaching out to people who are key in sharing this information, educating association members and potentially corporate employees as well. We were excited to share this information, but I had a personal connection because Rosanna and I actually had first met over a chamber virtual event in the spring of 2020 as everything was coming down. And that was the first time I had met her in person. So it was a reminder of just how important those personal connections are. We plan to work together to continue to raise the awareness of all of the protections, the layers of mitigation that are in place across the travel experience so that hopefully we can all together uh, restore business travel in a meaningful way. As I wrap up today, I just wanna uh, share some good news. I've been asked multiple times throughout the pandemic, is there any silver lining at all? Well, I'm gonna leave you with three thoughts. One is that, um, even as we saw the worst of the worst coming to the country and to our, the most challenging days of the airline industry last spring, our carrier members at A4A took off their brand hats, came to Washington, worked together, locked arms, and they forged a plan forward to rescue and save the industry and to save hundreds of thousands of jobs. We worked closer than ever before with our labor partners and more than 450,000 men and women sent letters, emails, tweets to Capitol Hill with one clear message. And that was save our jobs. We are all so grateful to Congress and to administrations for saving those jobs and approving the payroll support program, not once, not twice, but three times. That effort has gone a long way in saving those jobs and keeping those men and women, the pilots, the flight attendants, the mechanics, the gate agents on the job, ready to go. We also want to recognize the work of our industry partners. We heard from Dan a few minutes ago about the importance of building those industry links, the connections, the relationships. We work tightly and succinctly with our industry partners throughout this. And I think we forged relationships stronger than we've ever had. From a communications st point, standpoint in particular, 
We have worked with communicators across the board and we've even forged a communicators group for industry stakeholders that we never had before. We worked through the rescue and the recovery, and we will continue to work through the recovery, but we're also going to identify other issues of mutual concern where, as we move forward. Things like sustainability initiatives where we can augment each other's work. And then lastly, I mentioned a few minutes ago the importance of innovation and tech uh, touchless technology. Our airlines really leaned into that during the pandemic, and they are continuing to move forward on that track. Just for an example, the next time you check in or you even buy a ticket to fly, go ahead and make sure you have your airline app on your phone. I think you'll be surprised by everything you can do right then and there. Thank you again today for your time. Thanks to the chamber. And I invite you to go to airlines.org to learn more about what the U.S. carriers have been doing through the pandemic and what we're going to be doing into the future. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. My name is Helena Bononi and I represent the World Travel Tourism Council, a global organization. WTTC has a unique mandate and overview on all matters related to business and leisure travel. Our organization works to raise awareness of travel and tourism as one of the world's largest industry. Excellent content shared today. On my presentation, I'll provide you with global numbers and insights based on our data and research in partnership with Oxford Economics. On my first slide, I have the global economic impact. We released economic impact that shows the data for 2020 compared to 2019. 2019, the traveling and tourism sector contributed to 10.4% GDP globally. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, the number came down to 5.5% GDP contribution. The total travel sector GDP change in 2020, as you see, was negative 49%, while the global economy GDP change was minus 3.7%. We continue to work with governments to identify best practices to recover and bring back jobs to the sector. When it comes to employment, uh, the industry supported over 300 million jobs, but was down to 270 million jobs year over year. The industry lost almost 62 million jobs, and we need to protect the jobs at risk as well, and also bring back the jobs lost due to the pandemic. Important to highlight, uh, for all of the jobs impacted, there is a disproportional impact to women, youth, and other minorities. And to say that uh, 185 countries we track every single year uh, based on the economic impact over the last 30 years, all of them have been impacted by the pandemic. The next slide, I show uh, a few more uh, numbers and highlights in regards to 2019 compared to 2020. As you can see, leisure spending declined 49% in 2020 and business spending declined 61%. These are global numbers. As a result of that, the share of travel spending that comes from leisure travel rose to 82% in 2020. In terms of domestic, it declined by 45%, and international spending declined by 69% in 2020, when compared to last year, the previous year. As a result of that, share um, of domestic spending rose to 82% in 2020. On the next slide, a few projections when we look uh, what the future brings us. There are some bright spots when we look at the future. Our projection shows that the travel sector contribution to GDP could rise sharply this year and almost reach same levels of 2019. Additionally, related to employment, jobs could grow by 12% in 2021, approximately 33 million jobs, and 11.9% uh, in 2022 or 36 million jobs. So this means that the 62 million jobs lost could be recovered by 2022. However, this is contingent and only possible if the global vaccine rollout keeps its pace and restrictions continue to be relaxed throughout the summer into the fall. It's also important to follow the WTTC key principles, work with the private sector, 
also with feedback from ministers around the world. So in the next slide, I'd like to uh, share some of our principles and recommendations when we talk to governments. We had conversations with members and we listened to the concern from the travelers, from the private and public sectors. And based on information gathered and the fact that COVID cases are actually on the rise in some regions, while vaccines are working, there are obviously still concerns around travel restrictions and lack of aligned standards around the world. We came up with these four points, which got support from our members and from the industry and from other organizations. The first one is around harmonization. So having that consistent protocol but protocol need to be data-driven and risk-based. So for example, the UK and the US currently are basically at the same level in the sense of Delta cases are on the rise, but vaccinations rollout has been, have been successful and other COVID metrics. So our thought is that when two countries are in similar health situation, why not having protocols that allows more freedom of movement? Also, uh, the second point is precisely because vaccines are working, having reduced protocols for vaccinated travelers. We have started to see this trend, but unfortunately, we're also seeing issues around vaccines recognition. The different health agencies around the world have approved a number of vaccines, but this some with differences. And it also adds an additional layer of complexity to the sector, which we want to avoid. Third, health passes. They are really critical for recovery to prove the traveler's vaccination or test results, to streamline the process, to reduce manual checks, and to facilitate for travelers moving to electronic and touchless options. And lastly, the importance of health and safety protocols, particularly face masks. Our industry is very adamant that we need to prevent the spread. We are willing to keep health protocols, including masks. There, there are lots of details around these principles and uh, these will be updated as the situation evolves. On the next slide, uh, I just would like to highlight uh, a flavor of what 2009 looked like based on absolute size, the largest regional economies, Asia Pacific, North America and Europe. We have two more pieces of information here, contribution to GDP and jobs. In the 2020 performance, there were declines across the board and also different performance across the regions. North America had negative 42.2% GDP change in 2020 and negative 27.9% change in jobs. On the next slide, you see uh, some of the uh, details uh, on the top 20 countries. This is total impact of the travel and tourism, direct impact, indirect, and induced. The US retained its first position as the largest travel and tourism economy. I would like to point out Germany, Japan, and the UK, although they have similar reliance on domestic versus international travel. However, the story was different. As you can see, Germany and Japan retained their position compared to 2019, while the UK, which had more restricted mobility restrictions, declined to eighth position. So we are looking at the countries, we are looking at their data and performance, and uh, our goal is to discuss these best practices with governments, making sure uh, we have favorable solutions and one that supports the international mobility. And finally, on my last slide, just our key takeaways. It's important to mention that if the global vaccine rollout continues at pace and travel restrictions are relaxed throughout the fall, the 62 million jobs lost in 2020 could return by 2022. We'll continue to work with governments to support a fast recovery. Thank you all for your time. Sixty-two million jobs. Thank you, Helena. Uh, as as Helena noted, we need to prevent the spread of COVID nineteen. The lasting health and economic recovery depends on the global vaccine rollout. That's a top concern for governments, NGOs, and businesses around the world. Ultimately, as has been said many times, it is science in the form of vaccines and other innovations that will get us through this pandemic. 
And there's a lot to be optimistic about. Our guests covered a lot of territory during this program. I think you'll agree that people are working across the travel industry to protect people using the best available scientific evidence about how SARS-CoV-2 spreads and which mitigation measures work the best to protect travelers. We thank all of today's speakers for sharing their expertise and all of you for tuning in. A few housekeeping notes. Today's event is part of a broader effort to educate the public about COVID-19. Next month, we're hosting an Ask Me Anything with experts who will answer pretty much any question folks have about COVID-19 vaccines. If you have employees, please consider encouraging them to tune in for that special edition of Path Forward Ask Me Anything. They'll get answers to the questions that might be keeping them from making the personal decision to get vaccinated. And on August 26th, we'll host Surgeon General Vivek Murthy as part of our Path Forward series. He'll answer questions about Delta and other updates on the state of the pandemic in the United States and around the world. We'll be sending information about both of these events in the coming days, and we hope to see you there. In the meantime, thank you again for joining us. Please be well.